Bookaholics is a safe place for reading junkies who obsess over books, authors, bookstores, book news, and book trivia. We'll nerd out with book reviews, author interviews, our habit, and other bookish things. Here is your host, Deirdre Pippins. Hello, Bookaholics. This is Deirdre Pippins, the queen of Bookaholics. I know it's been a little while since you heard from me, but we did have to handle some business with this podcast because we only want to bring you the best content and production. So here we go. So what we're going to do is go through my 2021 reading challenge or reading list and um, see what uh, the reasons why I selected the books that I did and explore that a little bit more. And if you are a fan uh, of mine, whether on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, maybe there's a book that you've also read off this list. Email me at readingjunkie at book a holic.com and maybe I will select you to appear on a future show and we can discuss the book. I think that would be fun and I think that would be enlightening for everyone. You know, do you remember back, maybe say you took an English literature um, class and of course the professor knew all about it and Sometimes those, you know, you and your fellow um, classmates were bewildered about the book. You were had a whole total different interpretation uh, and your professor had quite another uh, or your professor loved the book and loved the author. And you were like, this is terrible. You know, so it will be very interesting. And, and I am planning on doing this comparison with a, a very popular book from last year. Um, I'm planning on doing that with a guest. But um, but if you read any of these books that I'm going to be mentioning, and like I said, if you're fan of mine on social media, hit me up at the email readingjunkie at book-a-holic.com and maybe I'll bring you on and we'll discuss the book and see how um, you feel about it. Maybe you and I feel completely different about a book and we can find out why and, and you know, see and have a great banter about what's likable, what's dislikable about a particular book. But anyway, so let's get into this. Um, The 22 book list, hopefully it's not going to um, take up too much time, but I decided, as I was saying earlier, I wanted to continue my exploration of embracing the authors of the African diaspora. And on my list, there are legends such as James Baldwin, Ralph Ellison, and Richard Wright, Toni Morrison. And what I'm terming as unsung legends, Wallace Thurman, Ann Petrie, and Nella Larson. And then I have named some emerging legends, Yag Yassi, Holson Whitehead, and Sadiqa Johnson. I'm going to cover some nonfiction by Octavia Butler, nonfiction by Isabel Wilkerson, and Ibram X. Kende. I hope I'm pronouncing his word right, name right. And a uh, young adult, Tiffany D. Jackson. So my books are going to address history, fantasy, facts, colorism, racism, sociology. Um, There's also some anthology uh, books on this list as well. Um, This book challenge will allow you to look at an overview of life experienced by people of color on many levels. Now, this book list should be read by any and everyone from any background or culture. As I've stated in previous shows, I think that's one of our first places of understanding. You know, we need to read different books about each other. And yes, I have spent many years reading books about white people and white life and that type of thing. And so I think we just need some cross-cultural exchanges. And I'm hoping that this um, book list will read people who are not uh, descendants, uh, African American, African descendants. Uh, It's very important that anybody uh, from any background read these books. 
So like I said earlier, let's dive right into it. We're going to start with a book called Yellow Wife by Sadiqwa Johnson. And I'm hoping I'm saying Sadiqwa's name correctly. Interestingly, Sadiqwa and I kind of sort of know each other. Both of us are members of a um, civic organization. And so I have met her and seen her before. And I always knew she was an author and she's written other books, but this one uh, has been celebrated quite a bit and it's outstanding. It is based on a true story. Uh, so you, you'll absolutely love that. But I'll just give you a little quick paragraph. Born on a plantation in Charles City, Virginia, Phoebe Dolores Brown has lived a relatively sheltered life. Shielded by her mother's position at the estates as the estate's medicine woman and cherished by the master's sister, she is set apart from the others on the plantation belonging to neither world. Well, okay, so then next thing you know, though, her life spirals out of control and she's led to Richmond, Virginia, where she has to survive being still between both worlds in this hellish place called The Devil's Half Acre. You must read this book because it, like I said, it is based on history. And so it's a story you probably never have heard. So it's going to be very interesting uh, to read that. So it's got a little bit of everything. It's got, it's a thriller. It's historical. Um, it's got sex. It's got everything. So check that out. That's Yellow Wife by Sadiqa Johnson. And you'll be able to uh, go on my website and uh, see these books. I've written a blog about it already. And then I'm hoping to have a section called, a menu called Library. And you can just click in there. And you also be able to order these books straight from my site. And just a disclaimer, I am an affiliate so I may earn a little commission if you order some of the books. Okay, so moving on, I have three books on this list by this one person, Ibram X. Kendi. I first saw him on MSNBC. Uh, I have been thrilled by his writing. Uh, it's just truth-seeking serum writing. And the three books I have on this list from him are Stamped from the Beginning, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and 400 Souls. You've probably heard quite a bit already about how to be an anti-racist. Um, so I'm not going to really go over that. I may read a few sentences about that. But Stamped from the Beginning, which is I'm considering a tome, it is very thick. Um, but you can read it in bite-sized pieces. And the thing about Stamp from the Beginning, it is where you'll read and you'll be totally fascinated about where in the world these racist ideas have come from. And these racist ideas have gone through generation to generation to generation, um, so much so, and they're so deep in our culture that some African Americans believe these racist ideas and our society operates in part by some of these racist ideas. You must read this, this book. I'm not even finished with it. Like I said, it's thick, but you'll be just floored from the beginning. 400 Souls is a book that um, Ibram wrote with Keisha in Blaine, and it's an um, entire book, again, another tome, um, but it gives you, um, it starts in 1619, and it goes on to the 20th century, and it just gives different, um, from uh, essays, historical essays, and short stories, personal vignettes, uh, even poetry but it will follow a timeline from 1619 to the 20th century. So that is easily to be read in bite-sized pieces because each story is not a continuous story. It's um, different things that I just mentioned. And so uh, that'll be easily, you can read that in part, a story a day or 
a few stories in a week or something like that um, to get through that. The um, how to be an anti-racist is um, anti-racism is a transformative concept that reorients and re-energizes the conversation about racism and even more fundamentally points us towards liberating new ways of thinking about ourselves and each other. So that is um, another book by him. He, he, um, he's, I've got three books, like I said, uh, by him on this list. So you can tell that I am I'm very impressed um, by his writing. Um, going on to, I want to go on to the legends and uh, James Baldwin. I mean, definitely a legend. I have two of his books on this list, Notes of a Native Son and Go Tell It on the Mountain and Go Tell It on the Mountain. Maybe some of you read that in literature class. I did not. This is one of the embarrassing parts that I have. I never read James Baldwin in school, uh, whether um local school or college. I never read him. Um, so, you know, at this point in my life, I'm just now reading James Baldwin. And again, that's totally embarrassingly, but this is about in one of America's greatest classics, Baldwin chronicles a 14 year old boy's discovery of the terms of his identity. Baldwin's rendering of his protagonist's spiritual, sexual, and moral struggle of self-invention opened new possibilities in the American language and in the way Americans understand themselves. Very good book. Um, it is a seminal book. So you've got to check that out if you've never read that. And Notes of a Native Son, um, I'll be curious to see how that relates, um, why he named that. Uh, when you've got Richard Wright's native son. Um, so I, w I would like to explore that. But he did write um, notes of a native son during the 1940s and the early 1950s. And it's a collection of essays that capture a view of Black life and uh, Black thought at the dawn of the civil rights movement. So that should be very fascinating. Just right before, I think, if you are of a certain age and grew up in an African-American household, you hear a lot about the civil rights movement, but that part pre-sething that movement, you don't hear a lot about. So that should be extremely interesting. Um, Richard Wright, Native Son, again, uh, one of those books that I have never um, read in school um, is kind of like maybe as I'm reading the description to you like today. Uh, and here it is. Right from the start, Bigger Thomas had been headed for jail. It could have been for assault or petty larceny. By chance, it was for murder and rape. Native Son tells the story of this young black man caught in a downward spiral after he kills a young white woman in a brief moment of panic. It is set in Chicago in the 1930s. So that um, it'll be interesting of what the take of that was um, and how it relates until today. Now let's, oh, we've got one more, one more. Um, no, not two more, excuse me. Um, Legends, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. This book I did read in college and I loved it. So much so, even when my sons were very young, I encouraged them to read this book and I bought a copy uh, for my older son to read. Now, I will say at the time that he did read it, he wasn't quite as impressed as I was. And maybe I would like to think if he were to reread it now, what would his take be on um, Invisible Man? I am planning on, of course, because it's on my list, reading this book again many years after college to see if it still resonates with me like it did. Um, so just to give you a background, the book's nameless narrator describes growing up in a Black community in the South, attending a Black college from which he is expelled. 
moving to New York and becoming the chief spokesman of a Harlem branch of the Brotherhood before retreating amid violence and confusion to the basement lair of the invisible man he invis imagines himself to be. So this was originally uh, written, published, excuse me, in 1952, and it remained on the bestseller list for 16 weeks. It won the National Book Award for Fiction and established Ralph Ellison as one of the key writers of the century. It really is a powerful book, and I am hoping that I rediscover it uh, and to the magnitude that I did in college. Then I have The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Now, I will go ahead and admit right now, I find, or at least I have found in the past, and it's been some years since I read Toni Morrison, and I did not read Toni Morrison under the instruction of a professor to help me peel away the layers and that type of thing. So I have found other books difficult to read and to understand, but I do believe at an older age and in this time frame that we're kind of reliving uh, that's mimicking some days of the past, I may be able to relate more to this. So this is The Bluest Eye, which was her first book. Uh, I think it was written in 1970 and it had a 50 year anniversary um, last year. So I'm want to definitely read this book. And it was uh, Morrison's best-selling first novel, Pakola Breedlove, an 11-year-old Black girl in an America whose love for its blonde, blue-eyed children can devastate all others. Praise for her eyes to turn blue so that she will be beautiful, so that people will look at her, so that her world will be different. So, wow, that's tragic, but, you know, it is a story that some people probably have, have lived. So it'd be very interesting to um, read The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Now I want to go into some of the writers that I termed as unsung legends. Now, where I even got these names from it just happened to be a, a postage stamp. I actually, I actually love postage stamps. Actually, I got it from my mom, I guess. And uh, I, got, I used to go to the post office and request uh, nice pictures on my stamps. You know, I didn't. I'm not just the flag person. I like to have the different artwork on the stamps. So, but anyway, so one of the recent um, twenty twenty. 2020, I picked up a, some stamps called Voices of the Harlem Renaissance. And I suppose you can go to the USPS website and purchase these stamps. And I was so intrigued at, because I hadn't, hadn't heard of any of these people. And the people on the stamps are Nella Larson, Arturo Schomburg, Ann Spencer, and Alan Locke. And so I, at the time, I got these stamps. I looked them up on, you know, the internet. And one that resonated with me was Nella Larson. And she is one in which I have a book on my list and it's called Passing. And Passing um, is just exactly what um, you think it is. It is a uh, thrilling, a powerful and thrilling and tragic tale about the fluidity of racial identity that continues to resonate today. Claire Kendry is living on the edge. Light-skinned, elegant, and ambitious, she is married to a racist white man unaware of her African-American heritage and has severed all ties to her past after deciding to pass, quote unquote, as a white woman. So you can already go ahead and think about how this could turn out uh, very, could turn out very horribly. So I will be checking this out. And when it relates um, to the vanishing half, you know, I think that's why a lot of people pick that book up originally. So I would like to, in a future podcast, compare uh, Passing and Britt Bennett's huge 
seller and winner of all kinds of acclaimed book, The Vanishing Half. Uh, and it would be interesting to get someone on as a guest, maybe you, to talk about both of these books and which one is best, which one, you know, the whatever. We can talk about all kinds of themes throughout both of those books. But um, that that is a book that I did put on my list. Now, another unsung um, writer is Anne, and I don't know if that's Anne Petrie or Anne Petrie, not sure, but she wrote a book called The Street, and I have that here. Uh, as I was looking at the other unsung uh, voices uh, of the Harlem Renaissance, I just kind of kept stumbling upon other authors that wrote during the Harlem Renaissance that I was not aware or, or familiar with. So, but the street follows the spirited Ludi Johnson, a newly single mother whose efforts to claim a share of the American dream for herself and her young son meet frustration at every turn in 1940s Harlem. Opening a fresh perspective on the realities and challenges of Black female working class life, The Street became the first novel by an African-American woman to sell more than a million copies. So definitely, I've got to read that and see what that's all about. Another one is called Brown Girl, Brown Stones. And here's another name. I'm not sure how to pronounce. Maybe it's just Paul, but Paul with an E or Pauly Marshall. Pauly or Paul Marshall, Brown Girl, Brown Stones. And this is set in Brooklyn during the Depression and World War II. Brown Girl, Brown Stones is the enduring story of a most extraordinary young woman. Selena Boyce, the daughter of Barbadian immigrants, is caught between the struggles of her hardworking, ambitious mother who wants to buy a house and educate her daughters and her father who longs to return to the land in Barbados. Oh, wow. So, you know, that's going to be uh, a yin and yang. <laughs> um, so that that should be a very good book. And last from the um, unsung uh, writers from the Harlem Renaissance is another book about colorism. And again, it would be interesting to line up The Vanishing Half, Passing, and Blacker the Berry all tied into one thing, maybe on the su subject of colorism. But Blacker the Berry was written by Wallace Thurman. Again, a name I had never heard. So the description of this book is Emma Lou was born black, too black for her own comfort and that of her social climbing wannabe family. Resented by those closest to her, she runs from her small town, her small hometown to Los Angeles and then to Harlem of the 1920s, seeking her identity and an escape from the pressures of the black community. She drifts from one loveless relationship to another in the search of in search for herself and a place in a society where prejudice towards her comes not only from whites, but from her own race. And so you can imagine how this may have gone in uh, the 1920s. So this will be interesting to take a look at that as well, um, because, you know, some of the stuff may be hard for people to hear, but, you know, we have to face these things head on and stop sweeping these horrible um, realities under the rug. And we just have to face them head on, um, just like um, people faced the George Floyd situation and all of these other horrific situations. They have to be faced uh, head on. And we cannot just let them go anymore. Um, we just have to address them. Whether we'll all end up agreeing is one thing, but people have to know what you're thinking and how you feel. That's very important. So just hold on tight and we'll be back with the remainder of the list. Okay, bookaholics, 
we're back. Let's continue to take this deep dive into my 2021 reading challenge reveal. Okay, so the next book we're starting with um, is called A Burning. It's a novel by Mega Majumdar. And I may be pronouncing that a little incorrectly, but the first name is M-E-G-H-A and the last name is M-A-J-U-M-D-A-R. And it's described as this. For readers of Tommy Orange, Yag Yasi, this is an electrifying debut novel about three unforgettable characters who seek to rise, rise to the middle class, rise to political power, rise to the fame in movies, and find their lives entangled in the wake of a catastrophe in contemporary India. Um, the, the National Book Award uh, has li listed this or described this as a gripping thriller with compassionate social commentary. Jaivan, who I'm assuming is the main character, is a Muslim girl from the slums determined to move up in life, etc. So I don't want to further release anymore because it sounds kind of like a spoiler what I was getting ready to read. But anyway, so we have one main character, Javon, and then we have two other characters. So that I thought belonged with my exploration of writers uh, from the African diaspora um, because we all originated from the continent of Africa. So there is that one. And that also goes towards my um, some debut novels that I also have on this list. Okay, moving on to science fiction. Now, I have seen this book and attempted this book a lot of different times, and I am going to give it my all one more time. And I think you, there's sometimes books you have to be in the mood for, you know, your mind has to be clear or, you know, to take on new concepts and that type of thing. So this book is a classic. I think it would be a cult classic more likely, but it is Kindred by Octavia Butler. And so I'll tell you the description of that. Dana, a modern Black woman, is celebrating her 26th birthday with her new husband when she is snatched abruptly from her home in California and transported to the antebellum South. Rufus, the white son of a plantation owner, is drowning, and Dana has been summoned to save him. Dana is drawn back repeatedly through time to the slave quarters, and each time the stay grows longer, more arduous, and more dangerous until it is uncertain whether or not Dana's life will end long before it has a chance to begin. Now, as I'm reading that to you, that description, it reminds me of a movie that my family and I watched during the intense part of the pandemic. It was called Antebellum. And that's reminiscent. The description is reminiscent of this movie Antebellum. And I wonder, did anybody catch that? Was that a copyright infringement? I can't really decide that until I read uh, the book Kindred. But it really harkens of that movie I saw um, last year, probably during this time or maybe during the summer uh, when we were in the thick of things of the pandemic. To see, I'll let you know in a, a, a future episode. That's that really surprising. Wow. Okay, so moving on to our um, debut novels. Here's one that I have, and it's called 50 Words for Rain. And here's another name I'm challenged with Asha Lemmy. And this is another debut author. Um, and here's its description. Such is eight-year-old Noroki Nori Kamazi's first lesson. She will not question why her mother abandoned her with only these final words. Oh, the final words were, do not question, do not fight, do not resist. And that 
I guess it's taking place, it's a, a historical fiction, it's taking place in Kyoto, Japan in 1948. She will not fight her confinement to the attic of her grandparents' imperial estate, and she will not resist the scalding chemical bath she receives daily to lighten her skin. The child of a married Japanese aristocrat and her African-American GI lover, Nori is an outsider from birth. And you can just stop right there. You should already be intrigued. So that sounds, you know, there, there again, this goes along the line of debut novels, uh, writers of the African diaspora, also, it goes in this whole realm that I want people to explore, whether it's racism uh, or intra-racism. You know, these are the things, these are the stories that we need to see, to read, to hear, um, to understand how to combat uh, what's going on today. Next is, of course, my favorite uh, new artist, new artist, new writer. She is an artist. Yag Yassi, I guess you say, I talk about her all the time, but uh, I'm reading, currently reading Home Going, and that was her debut novel in 2016. The description is Ghana, 18th century. Two half-sisters are born into different villages, each unaware of the other. One will marry an Englishman and lead a life of comfort in the palatial rooms of the Cape Coast Castle. The other will be captured in a raid on her village, imprisoned in the very same castle, and sold into slavery. Again, you don't need to read any further description because that's gripping enough. Now, Yaki Asli continues the story in a book called Transcendent Kingdom. And um, I believe this came out last year. Yes, yeah, September 2020. And this description is Yag Yasti's stunning follow-up to her acclaimed national bestseller, Homegoing, is a powerful, raw, intimate, deeply layered novel about a Ghanaian family in Alabama. Gifty is a sixth-year PhD candidate in neuroscience at the Stanford University of Medicine, studying reward-seeking behavior in mice and the neural circuits of depression and addiction. Her brother, Nana, was a gifted high school athlete who died of a heroin overdose after an ankle injury left him hooked on OxyContin. Her suicidal mother is living in her bed. So I can just stop right there. You know, there you, you have that and to see how that's going to tie back into the book Homegoing. So that's this is the follow-up to Homegoing, Transcendent Kingdom. Now from there, and I named Yagiyathi along with Colson Whitehead as your emerging legends. And Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railroad, um, which is on the list, is a book that I do remember checking out a few years ago. I can't remember the year this came out. Um, this says published date, but I think that's the paperback published date was 2018. I think the hard copy came out a few years earlier. And again, this was one of those books that I checked out at the library. But you know, if you're not in the not in the mood, but to use that word right now, if you're not in the mood to read certain things at certain times, you just can't get through them. So again, I purchased this book this time and I am going to get through it and, um, and let you know what I think about it. So here's its description. Cora is a slave on a cotton plantation in Georgia, an outcast even among her fellow Africans. She is on the cusp of womanhood. And so when Caesar, a slave who has recently arrived from Virginia, urges her to join him on the Underground Railroad, she seizes the opportunity and escapes with him. Wow. So, wow, that sounds intriguing. So a lot of these uh, books are kind of thrillers, social commentary thrillers if you will, is another um, tie-in to this book list. 
And last but not least, I believe I left off these two earlier, but should have mentioned them in the um, the nonfiction part is that we have two books here, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. And I heard already that this is a very, very good book. Um, she is a Pulitzer Prize, Isabel Wilkerson, let me just say again, is a Pulitzer Prize winning best-selling author of The Warmth of Other Suns. She examines the unspoken caste system that has shaped America and shows how our lives today are still defined by a hierarchy of human divisions. And I believe we can all agree that that's still so uh, in a, a lot of different ways. This is another book that has been very popular uh, to be nonfiction and uh, has been widely acclaimed. It's called White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. And this was written by Robin D'Angelo, who is not a member of the African diaspora, but um, this is a, um, a necessary book. It's uh, very necessary. And so its description is, uh, in this vital, necessary, and beautiful book, as Michael Eric Dyson um, describes it. Anti-racist educator Robin D'Angelo deftly illuminates the phenomenon of white fragility and allows us to understand racism as a practice, as a practice not restricted to bad people. Okay, so it refers to the defensive moves that white people make when challenged racially. White fragility is characterized by emotions such as anger fear and guilt, and by behaviors including argu argumentation and silence. These behaviors in turn function to reinstate white racial equilibrium and prevent any meaningful cross-racial dialogue. In this in-depth exploration, D'Angelo examines how white fragility develops, how it protects racial inequality, and what we can do to engage more constructively. Well, we definitely need that right now, immediately, definitely. And last but not least, I have another debut novel by a YA author. Um, Tiffany D. Jackson wrote the novel Grown. And it says here, uh-oh, she may be... Not, may not be a debut novel. Excuse me, I may have that wrong because it says award-winning author Tiffany D. Jackson delivers another riveting, ripped from the headlines mystery that exposes horrific secrets hiding behind the limelight and embraces the power of a young woman's voice. When legendary R&B artist Corey Fields spots Enchanted Jones at an audition, her dreams of being a famous singer take flight. Until Enchanted wakes up with blood on her hands and zero memory of the previous night. Who killed Corey Fields? Oh my goodness. So this is uh, another, I, I, I've had a, uh, uh, the thread between all of these books is like, whether fiction or nonfiction, they're thrillers in, in some sort of way also. They're thrillers, they can be debuts, they can be nonfiction, but they all have a thriller sense to them. Um, it's just that the descendants of Africans have been on the, the side of this particular thriller, um, both entertaining and both horrific at the same time. So I hope you get what I'm saying and what I mean. But those are the books my 2021 reading challenge has been revealed. So, wow, you got to digest that. That was a lot. So that might mean you need to listen to this podcast twice. How about that? That would be great. So anyway, let's jump back into it in just a few minutes and we'll discuss what this book uh, challenge will mean to us for the rest of the year. Stay tuned. All right, bookaholics. 
So after this reading challenge reveal for 2021, you might ask yourself, okay, so what do we do with this? Of course, we can uh, pick up some of these books uh, upon your suggestion, uh, Miss Bookaholic, and you know, just take a read and see if we like them, etc. However, I think it would be fantastic, and this is what I'm challenging to you to do also. Um, I want to challenge readers who love books like me, bookaholics, reach out to me at readingjunkie at book-a-holic.com and tell me the books you've read from this list, the ones you finished or plan to read, and maybe you will be a guest on my show. I would love to have regular readers like me, obsessive ones, who um, are willing to discuss some of these books, just or just one. We could pick a book um, for the show and then discuss it in depth. I would love to do that. So hit me up. If you've already read one of these books, then I would proceed to read the book if I hadn't already myself and then invite you onto the show. So this is my challenge to you. So hit me up, readingjunkie at book-a-holic.com. Check my website, bookaholic, book-a-holic.com regularly for my blog and podcast episodes. Don't forget, you can find the Bookaholic podcast on Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, and more um, wherever you like to stream music. But um, yes, my challenge to you is I'd love to hear from you, and I'd love to have you as a guest on the show. So like I said, it was a deep dive into my reading challenge for 2021. If you have any questions, shoot me an email, check out the blog. It may exp uh, explain more things to you. But let's get started. It's already May. <laughs> it's already May. Thank goodness I've already started on it. But I think some of you out there read a little faster than I do. So, you know, hit me up and, and let's see what we can do with this book list. So stay tuned. Uh, remember, I also have podcasts called Short Stories, where you can listen to me in bite-sized bits uh, and take in some information I may be giving out there concerning books and authors and book business and trivia, and it fits right into your schedule. They are usually five minutes or less. Just fit those into your schedule really quick as you're dashing around town. You can listen to a five-minute blog podcast and get your fix on books. So, hey, there's that. So check that out, download them, and enjoy. And until next time, I will continue to be a bookaholic. Okay, don't forget to support your local library and your independent bookstores. Talk to you later. Thank you for joining the Bookaholic Podcast. We appreciate your support. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on Instagram at True Bookaholic. You can also email us at readingjunkie at book-a-holic.com. Don't forget to support your local library and independent bookstores.